Robbie Williams Rewind. Welcome to Robbie Williams Rewind. We are the champions. I'm Matt. And I'm Lucy. And along with help from special guest fans, we take you on an in-depth rewind through the solo career of multi-award winning singer, songwriter and entertainer, Robbie Williams. We're absolutely delighted to be able to welcome the Emmy, Grammy and BAFTA nominated director of Robbie's Netflix documentary to the podcast. Not only has Joe directed Robbie's documentary, but he also directed Lewis Capaldi, How I'm Feeling Now, Harry Potter 20th Anniversary Return to Hogwarts and Bross After the Screaming Stops. Welcome to the show, Joe. Hey, how's it going, guys? Good. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. see you. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, so now we've had the opportunity to watch the documentary plenty of times. <laughs> um, I just finished watching part four just as we were having dinner before this interview, actually. Um, again. Again, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we're looking forward to asking you all about it. And we've also got loads of questions from Robbie fans, uh, which we'll intersperse with ours. Sure. Yeah. Let's do it. I'm excited <laughs> to deep dive. <laughs> So tell us a bit about about you and how you became a filmmaker. Sure. I grew up in um, Newcastle, Pontine, and um, I guess since I was a kid, um, filmmaking was kind of something that I was sort of surrounded by. Um, my dad used to show me black and white films as a kid. My grandpa also used to show me uh, like early, you know, one of the first films I remember watching was The Third Man. And it kind of just went from there. It wasn't necessarily a family business, but then my brother went into it. My brother, who's 10 years older than me, Leo Perlman, who oh. runs a company called Fullwell 73, who do the Kardashians, and they did the Late Late Show with James Corden. So oh. he was doing it. So it kind of felt like an achievable goal. Yeah. Um, so when I kind of, I went to film school in London, and um, I fell in love with documentary and got lucky to kind of tell these these amazing stories about these celebrities over the last few years that have uh, have seen to kind of resonate so much. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's that's kind of me. Oh, cool. And can you tell us a bit about how you became involved in Rob's documentary? Of course. Um, so I uh, I was finishing up the Lewis Capaldi documentary. And um, someone I was working with was moving over to a company called uh, RSA, which is run by Ridley Scott. It's Ridley Scott's company. And he said, when you're ready, we should chat because I think there's something really cool at this new company that we should talk about. So I was like, of course. Um, and uh, he moved over. He called me and he told me that Robbie Williams had 30,000 hours of archive and Netflix want to make a show with him. Um, <laughs> if I'm honest, I didn't know a huge amount about Robbie um, I, I knew some of the music um, and I guess I knew a load of the tabloid stuff. Um, but beyond that, I can't say I knew too much about the man. Mm -hmm. But the opportunity, you know, 30,000 hours of archive with someone who you know has lived a pretty insane life. Um, <laughs> the opportunity to see that was really exciting. So I yeah. kind of went into central London and they showed me some clips. And um, one of the clips they actually showed me isn't in the show. And it's amazing. Um, and it's it's Rob... Um, pontificating about the privileges he has in his life whilst as the camera moves out he is has a mangina <laughs> which is amazing <laughs> it but it was a couple of these clips and then i also Sounds saw the, right the, yeah the episode <laughs> two bit with jerry halliwell on holiday um i was shown that and, and and also a little bit around leeds tour and close encounters and i couldn't believe what i was being shown Mm. Um, not only you know it's the type of archive that you get given when someone passes away it's not really something that gets passed over when someone's still with us and obviously rob is very much still with us so uh i kind of jumped to the opportunity to meet him um and it kind of unfolded from there i guess incredible Th we're intrigued this is a bit of a technical question Thirty thousand hours of archive footage i mean how is all that stored and organized <laughs> uh it's it's not really oh. stored it's definitely stored <laughs> right. it's not organized so it's stored uh. in a place so outside near heathrow there's a place called iron mountain and iron mountain holds um musicians and celebrities stuff i guess yeah. their yeah. archive and their guitars and and that kind of thing yeah. it's kind of cold storage that it just kind of exists yeah. forever. and robbie has a section and in that section was rob's archive um yeah. it was not organized it was so far from organized. I mean, it was, you'd pull a tape and it would be, you know, 
it would say 2003 this tour and it would be something in 94 would take that <laughs> oh. <laughs> it, was, it was that kind of level of not knowing what we were going to encounter which was both frustrating but also exciting because yeah you put a tape in and you know you're watching behind the scenes of the network amazing like it's a privilege to see that kind of stuff but you put another tape in and you're watching rob do cocaine in this london flat right. i mean it's that kind of it's that variety of what you're what you're experiencing mm. and seeing this yeah. man's life so um yeah, yeah. You, yeah i mean it's an opportunity as i say yeah so you and your team must have been there for a long time <laughs> yeah so so the whole project actually only took a year um, okay. from start to finish um, but from from the get-go we had an amazing team of archive producers I think she might have even been in touch with you guys Tess McNally yeah. and, and Sally Brindle oh, who yeah. guys kind of ran the archive and finding out what, what what was in the um yeah what was in that archive and logging it all and then an amazing team of researchers and editors and edit producers who just kind of dug in um yeah. you know we'd get these reports at the end of each day of what they've seen and breakdown of some of the dialogue and between you know rob and guy and that kind of thing and the, and the story i guess started to build from that right yeah. so you you watched most of the thirty thousand hours or i wouldn't say i watched most of i, say I watched <laughs> a chunk of it i wouldn't say i watched all of it um <laughs> But the but team watched, watched all of it. The team watched, I would say, almost all of it. I wow. bet there's a couple of tapes we didn't get to, yeah. but I wow. I think the reality, we got to as much as we physically could. Yeah, say. yeah. Incredible. Blimey. <laughs> so what was your perception of Rob before you met him? I guess the big Robbie Williams pop star, you know, big braggadocious on stage showing his bum, you know, the, the, the kind of character, I guess, that, again, like the... The tabloids like to show him as um and I, I think i also knew there was definitely a vulnerability to rob um because he's talked about it a lot and also you know you just have to listen to his lyrics to know that he's going through something going through stuff and uh he wants to talk yeah. about it openly in front of people and wants to connect with people um i i don't know i was excited to meet him if i'm honest and the first time i met him was in a uh in a hotel in central london and luckily he liked the bros film which was kind of a good a good evening. Um, but he 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 turned up in a full Gucci suit with no shirt on underneath, you know, tattoos exposed, and it felt like you were in the presence of a pop star. Um, but he uh, he, you know, he said to me, I wanted to. He wanted to make something different, and he really wanted to push it, something hadn't, people hadn't seen before necessarily. And uh, and then also he he was obviously ready to talk and be honest and truthful and tell his truth, um, whether that's the truth you want to believe or not. That's kind of part of the beauty of the show, I think, is you kind of get to look at the man as he tells you how he feels, and it's up to you whether or not you believe it or you or you don't, I guess. Um, but yeah, that that was, uh, I don't know. I didn't know much about him, if I'm honest. Right. I knew the hits. I definitely knew the hits. But <laughs> beyond that, I don't know I knew that much. All right. <laughs> so we believe you started the process with an initial interview, but you felt like you'd heard everything before. So tell us about how you came to realization that you were going to have to do something different to get Rob to open up. Well, I, I, I'd listen to a lot of, you know, you do a research period when you start the show yeah. and I'd listen to a lot of Rob's interviews, obviously, yeah. and read the books like feel and, <laughs> um, and I, I feel like at that point when going into the first interview, I had a pretty clear idea of what Rob, the, the story that Rob likes to tell. Um, you know, you've got to understand that these people are interviewed so much, so mm. much, and asked about their life so much that you, I mean, we all do it. When, you know, if you're telling, if you, again, you asked me about my life at the beginning of this, yeah. I filled out a thing about filmmaking in Newcastle. There's loads of details I could have, other things I could have told you, but that's what yeah. I wanted to tell you right now. Yes. And the reality is that, that, you know, we all have a narrative in our head that we want to give to the world at any given time. But is that true? And is that challengeable? And is that um, and how do you how do you challenge that without proof of a different yeah. narrative? Mm -hmm. So um, when we went into that first interview, it was great. I mean, it was great to chat to Rob, and uh, he's a great interview, as we've all seen a thousand times. But it just felt like it was going to take something, a bigger idea, to get him to go deeper, to understand, and to um, and to try to access a deeper place with this and make it mean something. Because that's also what I think going into it as well. We talked about how it can it can mean something. This shouldn't just be 
another piece of, I hate the word, content. Um, it, it needs to matter. You know, this is a legacy that you're putting out into the world on a massive platform with millions of people that are going to watch it. It needs it needs to be good. It needs to be exciting. It needs to be engaging. It needs to be all those things, but it also needs to matter. Um, it needs to open up a story around, you know, if it's it mental health, addiction, fame, whatever it is, but like you've got to access that um, and, and, and Rob brought into that. Mm-hmm. Right. So Monica Bortnowska, one of our listeners, sure. she asked, how did you decide on which clips to show to Rob? And can you des- describe the process and logic behind it? Um, yes. So from the 30, so from the 30,000 hours, it's like stress inducing to even think about this. 30, <laughs> from the 30,000 hours, um, again, as I say, we kind of whittled it down to about 10 hours i think um and that's what we decided to show to rob um there was a couple of different stories we wanted to tell so like his career the ups and downs of his career i mean mainly ups obviously um Mm -hmm. his career were important to chart just to keep you kind of grounded and knowing where rob was in that time but also you know you can see from the footage uh, because he is so open in those moments mentally where he is and that was also part of the kind of narrative that you're tracking. It's, it's kind of two things. Like as the success is going up, you're also seeing this decline of the person. Um, and it was it was kind of building the narrative around that because we, I guess we knew that that's what Rob was going to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I'm sure. I mean, we talked we talked a lot off camera, me and Rob, about what he did want to talk about. Um, very little about what he didn't want to talk about because there was very little he didn't want to talk about, which was great. Um, but I, I don't know. It was hard. I mean, it's a it's a responsibility to distill someone's life down to what it is. But equally, we were led by the archive. Like, that was the rule. If it wasn't in the archive, then it wasn't a story that we could tell because of how yeah. we were doing with the show. So, you know, equally, you know, there's nothing about childhood in this because... Mm-hmm we couldn't we don't have anything from rob's childhood it doesn't exist so it breaks the format of the show and it and it and it kind of it's quite a delicate thing um the reason you're leaning in the whole time it's you know it's created to make you want to do that um and and any little thing any little you know i i was on um was on radio earlier with radio 5 live with gordon uh, smart and he was talking about how we didn't talk about the emi deal moment you know, uh, which which beyond my wildest dreams. Yeah, that clip could have gone in as a tiny little moment, but like to unpick that, I don't like. What is there to unpick about that? Like he's yeah. being Rob on yeah. camera in front of everyone, mm. and also he's even talked about it since that it was yeah. a misquote and all these other things. So it's not even a real yeah. moment. Um, mm. so things that stick in your head about this character are not necessarily the thing, the things that mattered and the things that told the best story. Um, and that is ultimately what we're doing. I'm here. I'm as Rob would say, I'm here to entertain you. So that's <laughs> that's the point. Like we have right. to it has to be enjoyable. So um, that it's dictated by that. Yeah, true. And you've got so many moments and so many things that you could have included. I mean, you know, you had four four episodes to. <laughs> of course, and there are whole albums that we didn't talk about. You know, we didn't yeah. talk about winning when you're winning, and and you know there are things that we didn't talk about in this, which I understand that fans would be upset that they didn't. Yeah get those moments i get yeah. that but i can't it's it's got to be yeah. a big story than that it's um right. yeah it, it can't just be the it can't just be the hits sadly yeah right okay so i think i heard that you filmed for about seven to nine hours a day for like 25 days it was about that yeah seven yeah. so I, I went on <clears throat> when rob was doing the island tour uh when he was around ireland and doing a bit of the uk tour i traveled with him um, for a bit of that um, and then we kind of flew out to LA I guess it was early February for about 30 days and we kind of camped out at his house um, Ida and the family and everyone were incredibly welcoming and they gave us essentially a chunk of their house <laughs> to, to take over um, you know we had our team there and it was it was amazing they were amazingly welcoming um, and it was it was much easier for Rob because he could literally roll out of bed and in bed and we could be there set up and ready to go. So we knew we would get a lot more from him, not because he wouldn't have given us otherwise, but because he's not someone, you know, as it says in the show and as all his fans know, he's not someone who likes to go out. He's not someone who wants to be in public um, that doesn't make him feel comfortable. And the point of the show is to make him feel as comfortable as possible. So 
thankfully we were given you know really good access to the house and the family yeah. which was amazing um and they're lovely people so it was a pleasure yeah. to get to know them yeah and, and the bed wasn't a surprise to us obviously no. we've seen I, him do interviews from so many beds <laughs> of and, it, and as i said like it was it was because I did a load of FaceTimes and Zooms with Rob. We, Rob used to FaceTime me in the run-up to kind of deciding what we were going to do with the show, and he was always in bed. Yeah. And I asked him about it, and he said, this is my happy place. This is where I want to be. So it's the place he should be. Um, yeah. yes. It was a different conversation. The pants wasn't a conversation. The pants just happened. But that's also <laughs> Robbie Williams. So <laughs> oh, we've seen the tug of pants a few times, haven't we? Tiger pants, yeah. Um, <laughs> Not the Versace, but they Versace. These are Versace. Yeah, yeah, Versace, Versace yes. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, so Rob had no editorial control, uh, if we understand correctly. But I'm, what did his did his management have any say over what went in? No, so, so the way it works is you have you have factual accuracy. You check for factual accuracy. So we can't tell a story that doesn't exist. But in terms yeah. of creative control or anything like that. Mm. This is the kind of this is what you go into when you uh, when you make a show, I guess, uh, with me. Um, yeah, you, yeah, kind of, yeah. you, give, you give that over, and there's a huge amount of trust and support. Yeah. But that that's how it works. But ultimately, yeah. it comes down to factual accuracy. Like we can't tell a story that we can't check, and yeah. luckily, we didn't try to do that. Mm. Right. So, still on the pants. <laughs> Um, Jocelyn from USA asks, how much thought was given to the symbolism of Rob being so physically vulnerable in his in his underwear as he watched? Or was it just, you know, let Rob be as comfortable as he wanted to be? It was all symbolism. This is the, the of course, of course, that was the whole point of the pack. Of course, he's comfortable. And of course, it's Robbie Williams. But equally, the whole point and the whole point of rock DJ and all of the, all of that was, I, you know, this is me. I'm stripped bare for you. You know, I'm in my most natural habitat. I'm giving you full access to my family. I'm going to tell you my truth, and this is the way I want to give it to you. Um, it's incredibly honest to do that. Like, who else? I mean, no one else would ever do this. Global right. platform, millions of eyes. True. It's, um, it's unbelievable, and it's a testament to the man. So I think, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's exactly what what was the, what was the Jocelyn. exactly what Jocelyn's saying. It, it is entirely uh, that's the idea exactly. <laughs> And we read that the cinematographer, Seb Feehan, said to you, uh, some, said something to you on one of the days of the interview. Can you tell everyone what that was? <laughs> of course. There was, it was like day 10, I think. And just to preface this, Seb, the, the, it's like a, it, it was a massive room, but we were really crammed in a really tight spot to get close to, to Rob. And there was like, camera there's a uh, in front of me plus like the laptop and a load of uh, there's loads of other things going on and seb's like here so i've got like seb's bum here and then i've got <laughs> rob's balls there uh, and, and it's not the most natural position to be in and, it, and, and rob rob stands up to go to the toilet and it, you know one of the breaks that we took during it and seb just turned to me and said joe what what are we doing and i turned to him and said i'm not entirely sure but i think it's going to be good um and I think it was um but yeah no it was, uh, it was a very funny moment I'm sure we'll talk about that for a long time <laughs> <laughs> so can you explain why there's no talking heads in it for everyone sure I, I think um I think there's a lot there's a couple of different reasons firstly you get people from the past talking in the show so you get the perspective of them in the like Guy Chambers talks, okay. you get Jerry Halliwell talking about Rob, you get um, a number of different people through the show, especially in episode three, talking about Josie Cliff as manager. You okay. get all these people talking about Rob throughout. The idea of the show, as you saw, was for Rob to relive, reevaluate, understand his life and to let go of some of the things that he needs to let go of. Um, it's It's it wouldn't have worked to have other voices it, it, it it's it's just uh it's it's it, i guess it's kind of it's a bold idea because a lot of documentaries are you know very based on talking heads and and, yeah. and kind of um contradictory views and, and second thoughts and all that kind of stuff and a retrospective opinion but there was only one opinion i really wanted to hear and i only, and there was only really one opinion i thought that really mattered in this telling of this story yeah. uh, if all those people want to tell talk about rob they're more than welcome to i just did i thought that this was rob's opportunity to tell his story mm. 
um, as much as he could and and see what the viewer thought of how of, of Rob's take on that. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm proud of it. I'm proud that we did that. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Robbie Williams, and you're listening to Robbie Williams Rewind with the Champions. Um, so another listener, Idit Freeman Chazelle, asks, why was there no mention of Rob's parents throughout his journey? Sure. I mean, it was, what, again, it was sadly what I said before. It's um, We were very led by archive, and yeah. they weren't in the archive. There's a very occasional shot um, yeah. of them, mm-hmm. but the story wasn't there to be developed. I couldn't tell the whole story, um, yeah. sadly. And it was, it was something that kind of, kind of had to suffer, I guess, but equally, you know, the inciting moment for me in this story that I'm trying to tell of Rob's life was take that. It was joy yeah. and too much too young and having that experience. So, um, it's obviously an important part of Rob's life. Of course, it's his mum and dad. Um, but I, um, but it wasn't something that we could really explore. Yes. Uh, so sadly, we could understand. Okay. Yeah. And Silke from Germany asks: During the filming process, how hard was it to observe Rob? Sometimes I'm um, almost cracking under the images he had to watch. It, it was it was really hard at times. Um, we kind of uh, there were a few things that we sort of prepared for and prepared Rob for seeing. I guess uh, obviously Leeds is one of those moments. One of those moments. Mm. Reliving um, active addiction, of course, would be, you know, incredibly hard and triggering for someone who, you know, as, as I, I can't imagine, I've never been through that, but I'm sure struggles daily with addiction and dealing with with, with his issues. Um, but we had a, you know, a really robust duty of care kind of system in place where I would be checking in with Rob often, night before, after filming, seeing he's okay, speaking to Ida, um, and just kind of, taking him I guess on a bit of a journey through it um but then also we're here to do a job you've agreed to do this you know it's going to be painful and challenging um but it's for it's it's important um it feels important to do it so he there were some things that were really hard but he uh he was amazing to get through it I, I can't imagine what it must have taken out of him to do it but I also know as you all do if I'm seeing his Instagram post now that it's meant a huge amount to him and it's uh he's in a very very special place now which um i don't know he would have got to um without it Mm -hmm. yeah and a a similar sort of theme of question how did you strike a balance between showing rob the reality of his life but also kind of protecting him mentally i mean you obviously saw lots of footage there which wasn't shown to him yeah um it's a good question i i think it was just about kind of talking him through everything um Mm. i I, like he it was never obviously there were tons and tons of clips in there but he would know what we were going into that day because i mean he knows his life whether he can remember the details of it or not (laughs) Um, so you know going into close encounters he knew that he had two days that would lead essentially ending at leeds so i think you would see the you would see him progress through that and and sometimes we had to stop because there were times when understandably he just wanted to get through it um and there were times when he said you know it it was an exhausting process like it was a lot to get through it was very intense and very emotionally intense and there were times when we had to stop um because there are they were really long days we weren't under enormous amount of pressure to get it done but equally you know we've got to keep to budget and we've got to deliver a show to netflix on time so there's a lot of responsibility um, but you just got to know when to stop, I guess, and put yeah. the camera down um, and protect him because I, I'm making this with him. There's no point, um, you know, w- we're not going to get good things out of him the next day if we rin- rinse him. And it's not yeah. fair to do that. And he's a human. So we need to treat him with respect and kindness. Yeah. Um, and I think he did that. Right. Mm. So how often did you have to stop? Do you think, you know? Uh, I think I think there were we didn't necessarily have to stop many times, but there were two times when I remember getting to like early evening and looking at him and just being like, maybe we shouldn't, maybe let, let's just let's just kill it, let's just do it for the evening, because it, it's exhausting for everyone, you know, the whole yeah. team. As well, um, and it, it, you know, everyone needs to be on top form because you only get one shot at this as well. It's not like his 
you want to see the first reaction to him seeing Leeds, for example. Um, if we miss that, you know, if you're not on your, yeah. if you're not, then we can't relive that. You can't recreate that. This is very real. So everyone has to be, you know, yeah, well fed, slept, and kind of yeah. firing all cylinders to be able to really deliver for the show. Yeah. So that really answers our next question already. Is you you couldn't really reshoot any segments. There was, was nothing you wanted was, the moment. Yeah. Totally, like yeah. everything had to be kind of in the moment as much as it yeah. could be. And um, there was a couple of things that we revisited. Um, take that was one of them, <clears throat> but only because I, I feel like he. At the be- we we kind of started at the beginning. We did take that first, and then we got through. But obviously, you know, you do twenty five days of doing this, you get a hell of a lot better at, at it by day twenty five than you are at day one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's some things you want to revisit just to get a bit, you know, a better reply from Rob or whatever it is. But mostly, it was kind of in the moment reaction what you saw, right. um, just kind of free flowing and, and letting it letting it sort of happen. Yeah. Right. So Silke from Germany also said. The documentary concentrated on processing a lot of hurt, successfully, as we now know. Was this planned, or why do we not see more of the happy ending from the past 10 years? Is that more recent footage? Well, I think we we do pay tribute, I think, to the last um, the last kind of 10 years, and Rob's kind of uh, going into his golden age now and going back on stage and, and kind of happiness around the family. And I think, again, it sort of goes back to I can't tell everything um a a certain amount of time and thankfully it was four hours and netflix gave us that which is amazing um it could have been eight parts of course but we had four yeah and i think you've just got to you've got to make some choices i guess and um whatever rob's had an incredible you know since coming back from take that rejoining take that and going back out on tour and all those he's had an incredible career with some amazing albums and we we talk about that in the show but um, that wasn't what Rob was experiencing. That wasn't the point of the the show. The point of getting rid of the past and mm. and understanding, you know, some of the happiness maybe and some of the things that he couldn't appreciate in that moment because of where his ma- mind was and because of how dark, you know, things were for him and how um, battered he was by the press and all the other things that were happening to him to tr- kind of take some joy in some of those moments and and you know. I think it's been quite cathartic for him in that sense. Yeah. 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 So Amanda from the UK asked in episode three, Rob said he was late because he didn't want to come to come in today. Uh, did that happen more often than what we saw? And how did it affect the atmosphere in the room? And how did you deal with that? <laughs> no, that didn't happen very often. But what <laughs> would normally happen was Rob would wake up and uh, I'd like kind of, they had a, they had this beautiful patio which kind of looks into the living room, and I would kind of mill around the patio, just kind of waiting, chatting to some of the security guards, just waiting to maybe get a glimpse of him to go and like start trying to kind of get him into the bedroom, basically. Um, and inevitably, it would mean sitting down and having breakfast or lunch with him and chatting for a bit, looking at YouTube for a bit and hanging out and then kind of getting him going and getting him going. <laughs> but that day was when we looked at the um, the lead stuff on the Coast and Council store. So I, it wasn't surprising that he was um, struggling with that. But yeah. he was late that day because he was listening to Teddy sing and they were making pumpkin pie or whatever it was oh. and cake and stuff. So it wasn't so bad. I was okay that he. Uh, excuse. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't such a bad. It wasn't such a bad. Day. It wasn't good stuff, regardless. We must admit that the Leeds footage was pretty tough for us to watch because we were actually at that second gig. Yeah, um, and the thought so. of it being cancelled and him like suffering, and we hadn't even realised yeah. that he was suffering so much while we were watching him. You know. Yeah, of it's course. Weird. We felt there was something not quite right because obviously we've seen him so much. He's such a great actor, but we could. And certainly see there was something in his eyes, something in his face that wasn't quite right that night. I think particularly at the end, there's that shot that you catch just at the end and he's looking absolutely petrified. (laughs) And it wasn't like a a show. It wasn't, he wasn't doing it for show. I could say, see that it was, that was really him. It's the most incredible moment, I think, in the show. Yeah. His camera kind of flies over this enormous crowd and he looks straight into the lens and he says, did I do all right? Yeah, and you're just like, oh man, it's just it, it, you yeah. break for this guy. Your heart breaks for him because yeah. he, he, you know, you guys were there. He wanted to put that show on for you, but inside, he's as he said, he's he's gone. Like he's mm-hmm. battered. He's um, there's nothing. Um, mm-hmm. 
think, yeah, it's it's kind of incredible that someone can exist. It shows how strong he is. I yeah. think yeah. Um, that's a huge a huge thing to kind of see from this is it just shows the kind of resilience of the man and, and what he's capable of doing under such uh, immeasurable circumstances. Yeah, because mm-hmm. that's the night that he fell over on stage. Yes. But he... He got through it really well. Like Yeah, but I think that was just a trip. So I looked for that moment, which because a few people mentioned that moment to me. Um Jerry Jerry mentioned <laughs> yeah. that to me. Yeah. Um, he mentioned that to me. And I looked for it and I, I think it's just a slip. I think it was racist. It, it? it was a slip. It was a little yeah. bit damp, yeah. I think he just styled it out. He styled he it out extremely well. Yeah. I yeah. think he carried on singing on the floor and <laughs> yeah. then and then eventually got up. <laughs> he didn't drop the mic, that was the main thing. <laughs> no, Professional. Very Professional, very yeah. Funny. <laughs> so you showed clips of people and the press being cruel to him and then even some of the press reviewing the documentary still ridiculed him despite knowing how it affects him after having watched it but do you think that the documentary has helped people understand him better in the main yes i think that i think it has i think overwhelmingly the reception to the documentary has been uh, 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 an outpouring of love towards Rob and understanding of him, um, a a un, yeah, an understanding of him and what he was going through in those moments. And, and, and I, I've seen a lot of messages with people who think they understood him and thought they got what was going on. Couldn't imagine that he was, as you say, you know, standing in Leeds and going through all of that. Um, I don't think it's surprising that people Rob is polarizing and people love to hate on him. Yeah. Uh, let's be honest, like he. <laughs> He, he's that's part of who he is for whatever reason and they're going to continue to do that what's so upsetting about the things that these people were saying is nothing's changed and i guess that's what's obvious you know what yeah. the show does tell you is that this is a person who continues to really struggle um with who they are and what they've what they've gone through and their mental health and and how sensitive they are and how cut they are and how much you can affect them and why do you want to rub salt in that wound? Yeah, exactly. That's the kind of thing I don't really understand. Like, I, I don't know what it is about um, people that can't see a human just because they're celebrity. Yeah. Um, you know, we idolize these people and they they matter so much to us. And, um, you know, when have you ever been to a wedding that Angels isn't played? These songs matter to us. They, yeah. they find, you know, cultural moments for us and personal moments for us in our families. Um, but then on the other hand, we want to tell them their shit and tell them mm. that they're, you know, it's just that's the nature, unfortunately. Yeah. And I think Rob was very ballsy in putting himself, both literally, and <laughs> himself out there um, in this way. Yeah. Such a, a public platform in a in a time when celebrity documentary can be so untruthful and so controlled, mm-hmm. uh, he did the opposite. And yeah. I think that all that's what people have resonated with and they see that. Um, but there's always going to be people who hate. It doesn't matter. The same people gave him Bros three stars. So. Oh, there we go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they were wrong. <laughs> hmm. And in a similar vein, social media trolls um, always comment that Guy Chambers wrote all the songs, um, and we do see this a lot. Constantly. Um, even after watching the documentary where it showed him writing Karma Killer and Eternity and just literally just writing, the, singing lyrics on the spot without yeah. having even having them written down, some yeah. still say it. Um, was there any other footage that could have been included to shut them all up forever? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there probably was more uh, songwriting that could have gone in. But no, Rob, 100% wrote the songs, came yeah. up with a ton of the melodies. Guy and Rob did incredible work together. Rob would never have done that first album without Guy. It would never have been no. successful without yes. Guy. All of, you know, huge respect to what Guy did. Um, but the words are Rob, the melodies are Rob. And and let like you shouldn't kid like I don't know why you would try to um yeah, it's nonsense. Incredibly talented, incredibly creative, um, great voice, all the things. Like it's yeah. you're denying facts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Sophie Ellis Baxter has come out and apologised following the documentary Um, but obviously she and Rob made it up years ago is there no way Rob could have just said but we're friends now you know (laughs) watching that clip just to sort of tie the story up a bit so that people aren't thinking Sophie's still mean (laughs) (laughs) you could only didn't okay (laughs) 
There you I, go. I can't make it. Yeah, like I, I mean, you could, I could say it for him. I guess. <laughs> no, but like, no, I mean, he didn't. So, yeah, <laughs> that's <Good>. the story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, and or- Aurel from Israel would like to know why the reunion with Guy uh, wasn't shown to complete their story. Well, it it was shown. It just wasn't developed again as a story. Like you see right. Rob and I back together. Yeah. Uh, but again, like what is, what's the story? Like they decided to work together again. Yeah. Right. Like that's amazing. Um, but beyond that, there's it didn't lead to Rob's, happiness happiness it didn't lead to him yeah. getting to another place of contentment it didn't lead to any of those things so right. it's not part of the story like as i say like this okay. was Rob's story to tell if rob had talked about guy chamber meeting guy chambers again in 2017 and it completely changing the direction of his life i promise yeah. you it would have been in the show right. yeah. yeah but i can't tell a story that doesn't exist Got okay it. <laughs> Um, Ruben from New Zealand asked, was there one clip more than any other that you were devastated to have to leave out of the final cut? Yeah, the Mangina <laughs> clip. Yeah, that, <laughs> unfortunately, it was that. It's really funny. It's, I hope it got released one day. I don't know if it was like, yeah, that's a very good one. There was another one as well, the beginning of, so there were loads of outtakes from, is it Lady Madonna? She's when, Madonna. Yes, when he's dressed in. When he's dressed up, yeah. Yeah. That was hilarious. Fantastic outtakes from yeah. that. Never made it. Um, <clears throat> what else was good? Oh, the, I know it was a good one. The moment he gets his first tattoo. Oh, um, yeah. That's a pretty good one that didn't actually make it in the end. Um, I think he was in New Zealand when he got that, the big Maori one. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, there was some behind the scenes of the, the music video for Let Me Entertain You that probably I, I would have loved. But again, it's all... These are all lovely things that I wish one day will be out in the world, mm-hmm. but I've got a story to tell. Um, yeah. I've got a story to tell. Okay. <laughs> got it. <laughs> so Addy from Israel asks, um, why did Rob choose to expose Teddy and bring her out into the limelight after keeping her hidden for so long? Well, it was a, it was kind of a long conversation that we started at the beginning, um, mm-hmm. I asked early on whether or not we'd be able to show the kids to Rob and Ida. And they weren't sure yet. They they had been, I think um they would been they had been talking about whether or not they were gonna sh- start showing Teddy's face um to the world and whether when the time was right, I guess, to do that, um, and when they felt comfortable doing it. So we <clears throat> when we were filming with the kids, a lot of the time with the little kids, we kind of shot the behind their heads because we never felt like that yeah. was gonna be um possible. Um, but with Charlie a bit, and but mostly Teddy, um, she's just such a magnetic character who obviously, you know, the camera comes <laughs> out and she's in front of it. Um, and she's jazz hands, like she's, you know, Rob said it, she's more jazz hands than he ever was as a kid. Um, so you just try and stop that girl being in front of that camera. Right. And so, you know, all the moments in the show when she comes in, you know, the fantastic moment in episode one, when she asks Rob who he hated the most and take that, that was just her. She snuck in, she was hanging out watching and <laughs> just jumped into the room and got involved and she did it a few times. <laughs> so, it, you know, it was, um, when I showed Rob and Ida the show at the end, it had Teddy in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'd been blurring her face for all the cuts that we'd kind of shown to Netflix and people had been watching, but we took away the blurs and we showed them um, and they fell in love with the show and, and they felt like it was the time um, and the right way to show the world Teddy, I guess. Um, and she's a, she's a fucking superstar. <laughs> they are super poignant moments. I mean, it's just obviously we've seen we've seen the odd glimpse and, and, and we've seen the moments, but usually from behind. But I think, it, yeah, especially her playing on the piano at the end. I mean, that was just yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. Wrote that song. <laughs> Those are her lyrics. Um, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's her song. Yeah, so, uh, she's incredibly talented, and mm. as Rob keeps on saying, like he's gonna, he wants his moment on stage with his kid. Like I, I yeah, I, I, you know, that's gonna be an amazing thing for him. But uh, yeah, it's yeah. gonna be interesting to see. Yeah. <laughs> so first, I wants to know why nothing of his swing albums or Albert Hall performance were shown, as they were an enormous highlight of his career. I know you kind of mentioned that earlier, but but that in particular, because it's so different to 
other elements of his career, why that wasn't shown. I, I, yeah, I think it's a lot to do with the fact that it, it wasn't a musical exploration of Robbie Williams. Like the point wasn't like, look, he's doing this other direction now. Like we kind of saw that with Rude Box a bit. Mm -hmm. um, Post Guy Chambers, you kind of see that a bit that Rob's starting to experiment, I guess. Um, but again, it's it's um, it's the person's life, the experience, what he saw, what he was going through, and equally what the archive was showing us. Um, and if we didn't have it, we couldn't show it. So things like the Royal Albert Hall, we had the gig, but we had nothing around it. You don't have, you know, like Slane, for example, you have that incredible interview before he goes into Slane. Yes. Where he, yeah. you, know, you know, that that means you can build a scene and a moment out of it. Right. You can't right. do that out of just a performance. And okay. It used to be so much more than that. So there are restrictions in just how you kind of cut it together yes. and make it enjoyable and make you want to watch it. Yeah. Uh, that isn't just a kind of a... Uh, which I'm sure the fans would have loved, but like loads and loads of Rob singing and loads and loads of performance yes, yeah. would have been great, of course. <laughs> and I like tons of people would love that. But the point of this was I needed to do something for people who maybe didn't like Robbie and yeah. who uh, were going to come to it with a different perception of him. And because right. um, the fans are going to come, right? You guys always come. <laughs> yeah. Follow, and that's amazing. But yeah. how about we get some new fans for Rob? Yeah. yeah true sorry joe <laughs> it's a really demanding set of fans you know, i appreciate that we're pummeling you with all these questions of what's not in there we do love what is in there just to be clear <laughs> everybody loves what is in there but uh yeah but it you, wasn't yeah, yeah it wasn't you need the context i couldn't you could, give yeah. rob's youtube it wasn't something <laughs> i could deliver for netflix sadly <laughs> i'm sure that again like if you <laughs> I'm sure a lot of that archive maybe one day will be more available and uh, we'll see. We hope so. Yeah, yeah. definitely hope so. <laughs> Hi, I'm Robbie Williams and you're listening to Robbie Williams Rewind with the Champions. T Tamara Williams from Wales asks, what was the most notable moment of making it for you? What's the most notable moment? There was a really nice moment. So when I I flew out to meet Ida in LA um, in December of last year, I guess almost a year ago. Um, and it was, um, I wanted to chat to her about the show and what we were planning to do and kind of taking over that bit of the house as well and, and how she was going to kind of feel about that, which is a huge ask, of course. Um, and I turned up to the house, beautiful, beautiful house in LA and um, went into the kitchen and I didn't know that Ida and Rob knew that I was Jewish, but I'm very, you know, openly and, and I'm an observant Jew. And obviously Ida's Jewish and she had laid out a um, a menorah. It was Hanukkah. And she'd laid out a, a menorah, like a the candelabra with the lights on it. And she got a cake and she got all these things. And she thought, you know, because it was evening and it was like sixth day of, of, of Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. she, she invited me to light with the family. I don't know if they kind of, necessarily lit up until that point but it was such a lovely gesture of like we kind of we welcome you into our family and um oh, wow. it was kind of a beautiful it was a really welcoming moment and it kind of uh it certainly dropped my guard which uh which i i don't know if that was the plan but it was it felt like a <laughs> it felt like a massive hug um and that was that was kind of that was kind of beautiful and, and i guess from that moment on we really established a really nice relationship um which kind of developed to this day i mean i still speak to them all the time yeah. Oh, oh, thank you for sharing that. That's such a lovely moment. Yeah. Um, we you said at the big beginning of the show that you didn't know too much about Rob. So did it surprise you how different the two personas are? I mean, often we hear Rob talking about Rob and Robbie, and we we were all the fans talking that way as well. So did that? It, was that surprising for you? I I, I think it's a, is it surprising? I think it's surprising to an extent, but also like you don't actually believe that that guy who's on stage is like that at home, do you? <laughs> I think so, some so, people do. You can't well, sustain uh, that, can you? <laughs> oh, no, I know. I, I'm not sure you can really, I mean, he, he's very good at doing it for two hours, but asking him to do it for 24 hours, I'm not sure that's possible. Um, I, I don't think it's surprising in that sense. I think I was more surprised at how kind of quiet, considered, um, very creative and, and kind of a creative force he really was and it, in, not that I didn't think he was intelligent but super intelligent and cultured and, and, and really fascinated by things that I didn't think necessarily Robbie Williams would be fascinated by um so 
yeah, no, like just such an intriguing character. Um, the Rob versus Robbie thing is really interesting because I think they're much closer together now than they've ever been. I don't think. Um, mm. I think that I think they they I think Ida says it in the show. They really need each other to kind of exist now, and I think he understands that um, and what 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 it kind of means to be on stage and to provide for his family and what the, what his job means and what it means to kind of be at home and just be Rob, I guess, and and then and then kind of separate the two. So I think he's in a good place because of that, um, which is great. Um, Angela Saunders from Scotland wants to know, having done documentaries about Lewis Capaldi and Rob, do you think they have similarities? Uh, I think they have some similarities. I think um, they're, you know, fiercely talented, (laughs) but also, you know, it's, um, it's the case of, of, of getting a lot young, you know, too much too young. And what that does to a person when you don't necessarily have, um, you know, I don't know if, if there is a support system that can exist for this type of thing because uh, you know, your your a, a sixteen year old Robbie Williams wants to fulfill his dreams. That's what he wants to do. He's not thinking about what's going to happen in the future. He just wants to achieve and do his thing. So if you showed Rob, you know, some sort of weird Christmas Carol moment of being like in two thousand and in two thousand and three, two thousand three. When was Leeds? Sorry, I should know that. Two thousand six. 2006, in 2006, at Leeds, this is what's going to happen to you. Are you not going to go on that journey now? He's going to go on that journey. Like, of course he is, and he's going to want to do that. So the same with Lewis, you know. Lewis was, do th- I see him do hundreds of hours of press to push his album and work so hard and, and, and really, really, you know, dedicate himself to what he was doing, knowing that inside it's really affecting him and, and he's really struggling but it's what he wants to do and it's what he loves and it's what these people are born to do. So it's, it's, it's a really challenging, it's a really challenging idea. Um, which is, which is why I like making films about it. Cause it's really fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And I absolutely love the Lewis Capaldi documentary. It really touched me. It was just incredible. So when, so when we heard that you were working with Rob, it was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you sat and watched it with Rob when it was finished. Was it uncomfortable watching it? Uh, it's i don't know if it's uncomfortable because i've shown him the stuff so far so he knows right. he's not going to see the foot you know he's not going to see leads again yeah and react you know so that's that makes it easier right. i think um i think he had <laughs> he had such low expectations of what i could not me personally but what someone could create about the story of robbie williams that when I showed him the first few opening frames of the show, you know, when he's walking around his house at night, it's beautifully lit and it's super cinematic. Mm. I think he was just like, oh, really? oh, is that what you were doing while I was walking around on my laptop? Um, <laughs> I think he was more just intrigued and, and proud of what we have been able to make together. Um, it's scary, the journey to showing someone something. Like I always remember the showing the Bross guys the show for the first time, like that flight to LA was one of the scariest things I've ever done in my life. But when you get there, you settle in and you've got to be proud of what you've made and you've got to know, you know, there's going to be a conversation and some things are going to come up and they're going to take issue with some things potentially um, and be prepared for that. Mm-hmm. But again, like it's, uh, this is what, this is what we made. So, uh, and, he, and he, he is super proud of it. So I'm really, really proud to be able to give him that. Yeah. Uh, Jocelyn again from the USA would like to know what you and Rob thought of the London Netflix pop-up shop. We thought it was amazing. It was it was uh, an incredible experience. Um, I couldn't believe that they'd taken over a whole building to dedicate to a show I'd made and to something as well. <laughs> it felt like a huge privilege um, and really exciting. It was really exciting. It was a really good night. The night I went down, um, I got to meet um, you guys. Um, and uh, And... Yeah, it's re- it's really really cool. I mean, Netflix are amazing at pushing shows like this, and um, and I'm proud to kind of work with them. And I feel honoured that they put on something like that for us. So um, yeah. really exciting. But as I said to you before, I didn't get a poster. I didn't get a T-shirt. So there you go. We'll, we'll sort that out. We'll have to see what we can do. <laughs> we'll, we can help you out. <laughs> The fans absolutely loved it. That yeah. when, I mean, people flew from all over the world <laughs> to yeah. go and see it. So, um, yeah, it was quite special. 
It's been the number one watched TV show on Netflix in quite a lot of countries. Yes. How does that make you feel? Great. It's really exciting. I don't think you ever think when you set out making this that there that anyone's going to watch it never mind millions of people are going to watch it so to to know that it's doing really well and that people are really engaging with it is uh is really exciting um i hope it stays that way for a little bit longer although i've no doubt um netflix have got some massive shows coming very yeah. soon may tip us off slightly like, <laughs> oh the like, crown like the crown <laughs> and the squid game series but hey robin williams is massive um but yeah, no, we hit the right time, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and have you spoken to Rob since it's come out and how it, and about how it's been so well received as well? Yeah, we've spoken a number of times. Um, we've spoken quite a lot, actually. Um, he's he's really happy. He he mm-hmm. read me that Instagram post that he put out the other day um, about the the lady who was slating him and how he felt about that, which I thought was an excellent post. Um, <laughs> And yeah, he he says he feels like the whole world's giving him a massive hug. He's got he's uh, he sent me some emails from some people um, that you'd love to get emails from, especially at any time in your life. Never mind Aww. after releasing a Netflix series. Um, and people and a lot of a lot of people who feel like they understand him much better now. Um, you know, as I say, I was speaking to I was on Radio Five Live earlier today, and I was speaking to Gordon Smart, who was one of the guys who wasn't very kind to him. You know, he actually admitted pretty much on the show that he was the guy who wrote the Rubox article in Bazaar. Um, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I knew his name rung a bell. Yes. yes. Oh my god. So, um, there's some guilt attached to that as well. And 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 what and did he, he say he, about uh, that? He, did he? He did feel bad. Yes, yeah, yeah, very much so. Because I don't think anyone appreciated what Rob was going through in that time. Like, I don't think, firstly, we didn't take mental health seriously. No. So it was, you know, you've got, you've got all the houses, you've got private jets and all that nonsense, all the money in the world, but you, you should be happy. Nonsense. We know that's not the case, thankfully. Um, but also, Rob was quite an easy target, as we all know. And that was part of what the press kind of went for. And he, um, whether he meant to or not, he did make himself an easy target in a time when people wanted, were targeted. Um, sort of is what it is. But yeah, it's um, definitely guilt attached because you can't imagine that something you write could cause that much pain. Um, mm. Yeah, I think uh, I, I, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's really sad, but it's the reality of what was going on back then. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is it is sad because we know through speaking to Rob and lots of people he's worked with, he's so super creative. And I think, like you said, back in the day, mental health not being accepted, plus that being coupled with everyone has to stay in their lane, you know, and, and you know, it was just expected that you wouldn't be experimental and, you know, creative. I mean, I think it's changed a lot, though, hasn't it? Because, you know, people... People are celebrated now for changing lanes and being experimental and being a little bit different. Um, and I don't think the press is still there giving people a hard time, but yeah. Robbie doesn't seem to get the brunt of it so much as he no. used to, does he? So, no, they yeah. push it now. But also it's different because, you know, now it's social media and trolling and, and then that kind of thing. It's a different type of, yeah. of attacking. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know if it's harder or easier. I'm not really sure. I think we're more empathetic. I think we understand people a lot more now, and I think we we want to hear people's stories a lot more, a lot more now. But um, yeah, there's always going to be people who are going to want to hate. That's, mm. yeah. that's that's kind of yeah. Yeah. So, what makes you personally want to make documentaries like this? Uh, well, it's all about the characters. Um, for me, it's it's just it's just kind of. Uh, you know, I'm telling someone's story, so I've got to be intrigued by the person um, and, and wanting to kind of dig deep with them and understand who they are. But also, I think what's really exciting about these stories is it opens up a bigger conversation around topics like mental health addiction and those kind of things that allows people to talk with their families and loved ones about what's going on with them or what was going on with them back then. You know, something that's relatable and and understandable and, and you know, something that you can see in front of you. And I think that's... Um, that feels really important to be able to do that. Um, and certainly with Rob, you know, it's definitely opened up a conversation around mental health and addiction, as I say, and, you know, you could see it on Twitter. Um, and same with the kind of the Lewis documentary, you know, around Tourette's and and talking with your family and being open and actually expressing yourself and and and, uh, and really 
talking about your feelings, I guess. Um, these are these films sort of pioneer that. Um, we should be open. We should be talking about everything that we're going through um, because it's important because yeah. we're all going through something. Um, so we should talk about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we must ask you, have you got a favourite Robbie song? And what is it? <laughs> Uh, I think I do. I think I got a couple. I like. Um, um, I like. Is it morning? I like morning sun. The morning sun. Incredible I like morning song. sun. I think that's excellent. I think um, his um, his version of Family Coach is exceptional. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. I, I like a bit of Come Undone. Yeah, I like Come Undone. All the concerts that I've been to, I've always liked jamming out to Come Undone. Um, I don't know, man. Like. I think on Rude Box, I really like 80s and 90s. I think those are both really good tracks. Yeah, One they're my favourites. favourites. <laughs> yeah, they're really good. They're really, really yeah. good. Um, there's so much. He's incredibly talented, as I say. And um, there was a lot of belting Robbie Williams in my car making this show. A lot of not wanting to listen to Rob as well at times, but <laughs> a lot of wanting to listen to him as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you so much, Joe, for joining us. Yeah, oh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. We know how busy you are, so we really appreciate you spending the time and 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 also um, going under fire of all the all the fans demanding requests. But I, we think you <laughs> told an incredibly brilliant story, and you know, in in all seriousness, the fans did see an element um, of Rob's life that we hadn't seen before because it was under lock and key, you know, behind in the archive. So I think it's. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to have in the world. You know, we, we always wondered, Lucy and I, what has happened to all of that footage? And we've been asking it for quite a long time. And now we know, and you've brought it to life. So thank you, Joe. Incredible. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. Thank you so much for all the research help and working with us on the show as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I listened to all your podcasts as part of the research. Did you? Making the show. Yes, I did. Oh <laughs> So you. Uh, you know, I feel like I'm uh, I'm in the I'm in the company of celebrity right now. Oh, Aww, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. <laughs> okay. All right. See you soon. Thanks, Jay. Thanks. Bye. 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 Robbie Williams rewind.